The market really fixated on your comments on the earnings call that cancellations are stabilizing, green shoots are emerging. Can you point us to the metrics that you're looking at that suggest travel is in fact rebounding? Yeah, so we have very good signal across the globe on uh, on what's happening. And because we participate in virtually every part of the travel market, we can see it very quickly. So what we've seen is that uh, as governments, local or federal, et cetera, across the world have have opened up countries or said they're going to open up countries, we initially see a surge in search activity as people start to think about the opportunity that they will be able to travel. And then typically following that, you know, as people get closer or a country or a place opens up, we'll see them start to book and we see those booking trends continue. The cancellation part was really a different problem where you had a ton of consolidated cancellation happening in a very short period over the end of March and, and through April as all the countries of the world slowly, you know, uh, closed down. And we, uh, and we were dealing with all of those people who couldn't travel during those weeks or knew they wouldn't be able to travel in the coming weeks. And so that was a very compressed period. But since then, we've had um, a stabilization happen. As, as you know, people are keeping their travel booked for later in the year. They're less worried about it now because they think they will be able to travel. So things have settled down on the cancellation side. And uh, we're definitely seeing positive trends on the booking side. Some early encouraging signs. Uh, meanwhile, every company in the travel space has gone to the debt market to address liquidity concerns. What's unique to Expedia is you not only raised $2 billion in debt, but you took on two private equity investors, Silver Lake and Apollo Global. They both have board seats. So I'm curious what conversations have been like with, with those two firms and what changes they're pushing for internally. Uh, first of all, they've been very constructive partners. Um, they will have board seats. Uh, we were looking at virtually every form of additional capital to bolster our balance sheet. And really the most effective, efficient, least expensive solution we could find. Uh, the government plans, as you know, some of them have gone into place. Some of them have taken longer. We didn't feel like it was worth waiting around. The, the markets were very robust for us. And so we put a combination of capital together that we thought gave us the best collective cost solution and uh, and and the most the amount of capital we thought we needed uh, to have ample to get through the crisis. So uh, those private equity friends of ours were a piece of that. Uh, we're happy to have them along. I'm sure they will support what we're trying to do. I think they invested because they support what we're trying to do with the company, not because they have a different plan. They certainly. Uh, we certainly expect them to be constructive board members and, and help however they can. Yeah, it's the biggest pipe deal we've seen so far since the pandemic emerged, which, uh, you know, is another separate topic. But I'm curious if more m and is in the cards. It's certainly been a strategy that Expedia has used over the past 10 years, acquiring big brands like Orbitz and Travelocity. Is that a strategy that you will continue to use, especially given your uh, background in, in uh, private equity? Yeah, I think uh, we used acquisitions as a very effective tool for a number of years. But I think um, as we sit today, and if you listen to our call, we're highly focused on simplifying the company, how the company operates, uh, the technical platforms on which it operates, how we address having multiple brands and how we optimize for all the brands. And, uh, and I, so I think we certainly will continue to have our eyes open to things, but we will have a much more disciplined view that things have to fit into that operating model, as opposed to just interesting travel businesses that exist out there in the world. So I think we've used it well. Um, in a few cases, we may have overused it. Uh, we're going to be a lot more disciplined about what fits the, the mold that we want to go forward with. And hopefully, you know, we're, we're not going to get over our skis here. Uh, we raised a lot of capital as a defensive measure, but we do think, uh, presuming the economy continues to come back and travel continues to come back, that we will have excess capital and we'll certainly be able to look at those things if there's anything interesting out there. Yeah, uh, Peter, it's David. I might advise doing stock deals, though, instead of cash deals, but you probably already <laughs> knew that. Um, uh, as for cost of revenues, uh, you know, they grew 28 percent. You did have a higher provision for bad debts. And I'm curious as to whether you have any ability sort of to see forward and have expectations in terms of of whether that's going to get better, people's ability to pay is going to improve, or whether it's going to be a continued concern given the uncertainties in the economy? Uh, yeah, David, uh, I think what we saw on the bad debt side was really a function of the crisis. And uh, you have to remember that a, a, a large part of our business is a B2B business. We have, uh, we have business customers for whom we power their hotel travel or various parts of 
offline travel agents, all kinds of things. So um, we just took a view that it was very hard to predict uh, what position a lot of these businesses would be in. Um, and there would be a lot of noise in the whole cancellation process and chargebacks and all kinds of things happening on the consumer side. So I don't think it's a it's a trend. I think it was our position of being careful right now because a lot of things were hard to predict. Um, but uh, look, there will be fallout from what's happened. Obviously, there will be some travel companies uh, that don't make it. There will be some of our supply partners who don't make it. Uh, there may be some you know, vacation rental companies or individuals who don't make it through the other side. And that's part of the human crisis that's going on, uh, you know, from this pandemic and from the economic problems the world is having. But we think that as long as things are stabilizing and improving, that is not a long-term ongoing problem. There may be some dislocation from it, modest, and some noise as we get through this uh, this period. But I think it's no, there's no reason to assume that's a something that should remain consistent.